Colossians chapter 2. And I want to read verses 9 through 12. Keen in on verses 11 and 12 this morning. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 9. For in him, that's in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in immersion, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise your great and glorious name. Lord, we're thankful. We're thankful that you have communicated to us, Lord, in a way that, that we can't understand, but also in a way that, that requires us to stretch, that requires us to, to get our eyes, our spiritual eyes open, to move from the physical into the spiritual. As Brother Charlie was talking about, to, to be able to see into that realm of the unseen. We're thankful, Lord, for your word that tells us the things that we cannot see, that gives us information about the real world, the eternal one, the world behind the curtain. I'm thankful, Father, that you've told us the spiritual work that you do at our immersion into Christ. Help us to see it, to understand it, to believe it, to remember whom you've made us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So working here on uh, spiritual circumcision, <coughs> clicker doesn't want to click. Let's try this again. Well, my, does this want to click? Let's see here. All right. Let's see if we, there we go. All right. So real quickly, I just want to, uh, this, this summary, verse 11 and 12. In Christ, we received a spiritual circumcision, removal of the body and the flesh, been buried in immersion. We've been raised up with him through faith. And that faith is in the working of God. I actually took this a little bit backwards order, if you will. Last week, I really worked on verse 12, particularly the objection that people have out there that we can't be saved at immersion because they think that immersion is a work. And we know that we're not saved by works. But the scripture is definitive, and Colossians 2, verse 12 is actually my favorite verse on this topic because it clearly defines that at our immersion into Christ, it's our faith, it's God's work. There is a work that's being done. We believe. We believe in that which God says he's able to do. Charlie, I don't remember the setting in which I heard this from you. But it was years ago, and I'm not going to get it word for word, but the concept is stuck with me. And the thing that, that stuck with me is Charlie said, you know, we're immersed into Christ. And I, I want to be careful of context. Of course, when we get immersed into Christ, there's things that we need to understand, right? And, but he said, we're immersed into Christ. And he said, and then we, we spend the rest of our lives as Christians really figuring out what took place in our immersion. Something along those lines. I don't know if you probably don't remember saying it. I do, but your dad said it first. Oh. <laughs> well, I never heard him say it. I heard it from you. So thank you, Charlie. Uh, I like that. Uh, so, but, but that concept is so true. I mean, by faith, we understand the basis. But then we go back and we figure out, really buy into, believe what God says took place. And this is amazing, you guys. You know, the, the contrast of Colossians chapter 2 here is there, don't be taken captive by philosophy and empty deception. The world has all sorts of philosophies, lies, sell you this, this, you know, self-help, blah, blah, psychology, psychiatry, blah, blah, blah. They're never going to solve real problems. One solution. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's only one surgeon on earth that can perform the operation that God's talking about in Colossians 2, 11 and 12, and that is 
God our Father. The only one. And so where he says it takes place is where it takes place. I'm just reviewing. When we show up, we show up at our immersion into Christ, we believe that he is able to do exactly what he promises to do. Now, what is that? What does that entail? I want to work on that a little bit this morning. So spiritual circumcision, removal of the body of the flesh. I just want to talk briefly on us being buried in immersion and raised with him through faith. So circumcision. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 17. You know, it's really interesting to me. God, God has this huge plan from before he ever hit the start button and said go. God, well, to take words from Jesus, he said, inherit the kingdom prepared from you for, for you from before the foundation of the world. So God knew the end before he ever said, start. Now, it's interesting. Even in our adult Bible school class this morning, we were talking about Passover. And so God puts this Passover memorial into place. I mean, the actual Passover event, approximately 1,450 years, well, plus Jesus' lifetime. So close to 1,500 years before the Passover in which Jesus is crucified. Now, you know, it's really interesting. You can think about this two ways. You think, well, okay, God set that up and then has all the people coming there. You know, it just so happens that all these Jewish males got to come to the temple in Jerusalem at Passover and they see what happens to concern the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Everybody around the town of Jerusalem knows what took place. Okay? Really amazing. But actually, when you... Think about it. You read the scripture. God actually tells you he knew where he was going in the beginning. He actually intended for that very day to take place. And he worked his way backwards. And that's why he set up the physical Passover in the first place. It's not like you set up physical Passover and they're going to use it. He, he knew where he was going and going to use that. Because God had an intention every step along the way. Of the spiritual circumcision. He knew that's where he was going, and that's why he put this physical circumcision in place in the first place. Just want you to keep that in mind here as, as we look at this. Genesis chapter 17, beginning in verse 9. God said further to Abraham, Now, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house, or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house, or who is bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person should be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Pretty straightforward. You want to be one of God's people in the Old Testament? You want to be a Jew? You're a male. You have to be circumcised. And he says here in verse 13, My covenant, thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Okay? There's something very definitive about physical circumcision. In the flesh, and God says, this is my covenant, you will remember. You're mine. So we know God miraculously brought the nation of Israel into existence through Abraham. I got to really fly here, so hopefully your, your brain, Stephen, reading comprehension, turn it on as much as you got. Every male had to be circumcised and just... God said, covenant in your flesh. And anybody not circumcised, we're going to be cut off. We saw, actually, again, in adult Bible school class a little while ago, God was so serious about this. You, you remember, Moses, he really didn't want to be used by, I mean, he was afraid, right? All the excuses, and God says, come on, do this. But then, as Moses started to go, God says, you ain't going to go. Unless your son's circumcised. 
He wasn't going to allow him to do that job for which Moses was born unless Moses was willing to follow through on this covenant. Now, along the way, like I said, what God really had in mind was circumcision of the heart. Even in the Old Testament, I just want to read a couple of these real quick. I'll, we'll just pick for the sake of time. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. What God really wanted, Deuteronomy 10, verse 16, he says, circumcise then your heart and stiffen your neck no more. There's a heart problem. Way back to Deuteronomy, Moses, the, the second giving of the law, if you will, the, the summary of the law, circumcise your heart. Jeremiah, chapter 4, prophet Jeremiah comes along. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1, if you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, then you should return to me. If you'll put away your detested things from my presence and will not waver, you will swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness, then the nations will bless themselves in him, and in him they will glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and to Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Where God went all along, circumcision of the heart. Now how did Israel do on that? Anybody remember Stephen? He's getting to give a defense. He ends up being the first martyr under the New, New Testament. What, what's he tell the, the religious leaders there that are, that are coming after him, that are putting him on trial, if you will? He says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised, apart from the ears, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. You're always resisting the Holy Spirit, just as your fathers did. Israel never got this right, did they? And the problem. And the problem is, this isn't something we can do. You can't circumcise your own heart. There's a, I, I preached last week, there's only one surgeon in the entire universe that can perform this operation, and that's God. You can try it yourself. People have tried it themselves. And all the, again, all the stuff out there tries to, you know, give you the, the psychological help you need is never going to be able to deal with the real condition. And that's the condition of the human heart. I'm going to sidetrack for a second. Intentionally here, come in from one, one other angle. just want you to think about it. There's, when we're talking about lineage, okay, there's physical lineage and there's spiritual lineage. Don't have time to, to go there this morning, but you can look at the end of Galatians 3. We talked about a little bit last week, another verse, a passage that ties in faith and immersion. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you are immersed into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. As he goes on, the last verse there says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Abraham's seed heirs according to promise. There's spiritual lineage also, and that's the one we really want to get to. But in, the, in terms of the physical lineage, circumcision was a sign in the flesh that a male was an Israelite. And that was performed eight days after birth. What you think for a second about spiritual circumcision? There's a little difference here, isn't there? Spiritual, the spiritual lineage, let's go to Romans 9. Romans 9, verse 8, that is, it's not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. So just because you're a, you were a physical descendant of Abraham, just because you were circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin as a male, did not mean you were actually a part of 
God's real people. I already hit Galatians 3. There's a spiritual lineage. Now I, want you, I just want you to think about this with me for a second. Yeah, Romans chapter 2. My buddy Kevin Simpson likes to say, who did you? You did you, according to Romans chapter 2. And uh, that's the point he makes here, Romans 2, 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So who's, if you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's offspring. If you've been immersed into Christ, then you're a son of God through faith. You, you are Abraham's offspring. If you have been immersed into Christ, you've undergone a spiritual circumcision. You're actually the real Jew. Which, as a side note, guys, will help you understand a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament about restoration of Israel, that kind of stuff. It's actually talking about the church. And those things are going to apply to you individually as a Christian. But what's the determining factor here in whether or not somebody's a Jew, the real Jew? The determining factor is spiritual circumcision, that which is done to the heart by the Holy Spirit. Physical circumcision done on the eighth day of a boy's life. Already born, already brought into existence, and now we're going to go up to the temple, we're going to do this the circumcision, or that's actually, the, we would present him later, okay? But the eighth day, we're going to circumcise him. Spiritual circumcision, there's a different, big difference here I want you to recognize. Spiritual circumcision is actually done to make a new creature alive. You can't be a new creature without spiritual circumcision. This is the exact moment where a person gets into Christ. We talked about that some last week. And so Colossians 2, 11 and 12 is clear. That spiritual circumcision takes place in the waters of immersion. This, what, what all does that entail? That's what I want to work on a little bit this morning. The removal of the body of the flesh. Some people might, and I've had people say, well, Luke, you're, you're still in the flesh. They're going to have this debate, and I'm not even getting into the Greek today, but okay, you're, you're in this human body. You're still in the flesh. What, when the scripture's talking about the flesh, it's really talking about a fleshly mindset. And this fleshly mindset, it's like the mindset on the flesh, the scripture says, is death. The mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. The mindset on the flesh is in opposition to God. And brother, I, I just want you for a second to think about this with me. What it took God, what God did how do, I, how do I say this? This barrier is such a problem that the only way on God's end he could do something about it was through the death of his own son. It's a big barrier. Fleshly mindset problem. And so, you know, that, that problem is the human heart. How many of you here in our day, hey, follow your heart? Like, people gra young people graduate in the best words of wisdom. Follow your heart. You sure about that? Uh, what's Proverbs 28? I like this one. Now, I, I will say in passing, this is our culture right now. It is emotion-based. emotion based emotion takes feelings, your personal feelings is, has prevalence over any sort of logical reasoning. That's how we can, I, very, I'm personally very confused about this, I, I don't understand. My daughter Elena has taken anatomy and physiology class and even in anatomy and physiology now, they have to make a distinction between sex and gender. So you're, <laughs> Your sex is male or female because that's biological, but your gender is something separate because I don't understand it. 
But that's where, when emotion ends up taking prevalence over reason and logic, that's the kind of crazy stuff you, end, you can end up in. Proverbs 28, 26, there's a warning. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But he who walks wisely will be delivered. You know, the Hallmark movies seem fairly wholesome, but you know what the underlying theme of Hallmark movies are? Follow your heart. I mean, that's some of the best we got out there, guys. This is, this is a problem. Okay? You can't trust the human heart. The problem with the human heart is it, it does get, Satan gets a hook in it. And it's going to take a fleshly course. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says that the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Heart's a problem. Big, big problem. When, when the script's talking about the heart, it's not talking about, I've, you know, I think Mr. J. Wilson is what, 48 beats a minute? Are you 48 beats? Something like that. Used to be. So I'm glad it finally changed. He used to tell us my, his didn't change, couldn't go up and down. I believe that about him. Mine's always been substantially higher. Okay? But when the script's talking about the heart, it's not talking about this piece of machinery here that gives that beat, beat, beat. It's not about the, the core of your spiritual being, the seat of your desires. And the heart is a problem. Uh, Josiah this morning, great opening on the tongue and speaking life, which, by the way, a little great preview, guys, of some stuff that James is going to hit tonight in our groups. Okay. But what's Jesus say about the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart? I have, unfortunately, uh, there's some times in my life I really, 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 really wish I could take back some words that I've said. And I've said, I didn't mean that. Logically, true, it's not what I wanted to say, it's not... But Jesus would say, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. It's in there, isn't there? The heart's a problem. You aren't going to, you know, as Josiah pointed out this morning, no man can tame the tongue. It's going to take the Lord to do that. Because it's really, it's not tying this thing up. It's not putting the, the zip on our lip. It's changing what's in the heart. Go to Matthew chapter 15 also. I always used to like this one as a kid. Figured this out. Mom would tell me, did you wash your hands, whatever? I'm like, well, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles man. It proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles man. Scripture can be handy sometimes. And, uh, but Jesus is in the midst of this. He, he explains this. Matthew 15, we'll just start verse 17. He says, do you not understand... That everything goes into the mouth, passes into the stomach, is and is eliminated. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. This is the part I like for my mom to eat with unwashed hands and not defile the man. Okay. okay. But the point Jesus is making is the heart's problem. When we're talking about the flesh, Jesus is talking about changing the desires that are in here. That's, and, and brother, we can't do that on our own. So, not only did Jesus come to die to forgive us from those things, but he actually came and died and rose again and ascended to heaven and is our high priest to actually help us and gave us, sent us his spirit to actually change the very desires of our heart. We know those sins come from the heart, and so God's got to perform an operation. I preached about this last week. He is that spiritual heart surgeon, surgeon, the removal of the body of the flesh, the removal of the fleshly mindset. Now, I realized here, talking to my dad, he's got cataract surgery coming up. And I, he told me something. Because he's got these glasses that He's wearing right now from 
through some, some of his previous, the eyelid surgery stuff, and they're not the right prescription for him, so he's having a little bit of a tough time seeing. I said, well, after you get that cataract surgery, you'll have to get some glasses that are actually the right prescription. Where he's like, I won't need them. It's like, what? I had no idea, guys, what happens in cataract surgery. Cataracts, you know, the, I don't know, my, this is my very uneducated explanation. I always thought, it was like, you know, basically some film that comes over your eyes and they got to go in there and scrape the film. Well, what they do is they actually, when they do that, when they get rid of the cataracts, they actually give you new lenses for your eyes. That are 2020. And I thought, you know, that, that kind of fits in here. When God circumcises the heart, he's removing that barrier of flesh, that problem that we had that we created, and he's removing that, but actually the scripture will also sometimes speak to him as giving us a new heart. It's prophesied back there in Ezekiel chapter 36. It's a whole new heart. Sees things the right way. Desires the same things God desires. Now some of us, we've not been immersed into Christ. I mean, you can chip away on your own. But you're going to continue to be blinded. You're going to, your heart's going to continue to be a problem that you can't handle on your own. It's going to need to undergo that spiritual circumcision as your immersion into Christ. He goes on in Colossians 2, and he says, kind of explains it a little different way. From that circumcision made without hands, he said, the, the remove the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in immersion. And we know from other passages, the old man's crucified. Which is really a great thing, to have that old guy put to death, right? And then he says, buried with him in immersion. Most of the time, if somebody dies, you go, and there's a memorial service, right? Sometimes now it's called celebration of life because people are afraid to actually go into a house of mourning and have to think. So, But a memorial service, and hopefully there are some memories, and hopefully there's also a challenge. Think about your eternity. And then later there's a... Maybe a graveside service, and there's an actual burial. And in that burial, I tried to explain this in the Philippines, and it totally, the stuff I said, I said six foot deep. And then I realized, they don't, they don't do that. <laughs> they, they put stuff up. Okay? But, but in ours, we, we cut that hole in the ground, and you see that casket laid in there, and then the dirt is pushed over the top, buried. What, what's the purpose of why do we do that? It's really the last place, isn't it? People are, you're crying, putting the, the flowers there on it. It's, it's closure, what it is. Closure. Saying goodbye. Oh, brother, I want to exhort you from the scriptures that our past, you know, that one part of the psychological thing today is, you know, basically, okay, I'll be a little facetious about this, but let's figure out why you have these problems you have and who we can blame them on. Okay, that's a little facetious. Some, sometimes there are some things that, that are going on in our human heart we do have to figure out. Okay, where's that coming from in here? But the solution is never going to be to go back and rehash the problems. The scripture talks about crucified. That is, there's some going through. But then it talks about a burial. And this is what we got to get into our mind. What God says, the old man died and is buried. Don't dig him up. There's a closure there. 
the old man's buried. Now there's a temptation. Get out there in the middle of the night, go back out there with that shovel. Don't do it. If we've been immersed into Christ, I want you to just consider with me, when we went to the waters of immersion, we went in faith, believing God would perform his work. We need to renew that faith. Remember, that old person, the old man is buried. Gone. Leave him there. Buried. The scripture also has been raised with Christ. It's a new life. This is what we need. This is what the world needs. This is a message, brother, and the whole world needs to hear. There's only one way anybody's ever going to be able to actually be alive. And that's the life that Christ gives at our resurrection. Go with with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, 1 through 11 really explains this in 11 verses instead of 1. I'm not going to go through all of it. I have been going back and trying in my, in my own mind to, uh, in the morning, every morning, start my day by just quoting Romans 6, 1 through 11. It's a good reminder. It's what Charlie said. I guess Mr. J. Wilson said, I quote him enough. I'm going to just quote you, Charlie. Uh, remembering. Remembering what took place. Figuring that out. Do you not know? Is the way he addresses the Romans. Like, remember this, right? This is what took place in the waters of immersion. And the last part of this. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I have debates with friendly debates with well, most of the time, friendly, with uh, people who actually would say, would say immersion is necessary for forgiveness of sins. But they're basically going to say, you're going to always be a sinner. You're always going to be tempted. You're always going to... Okay. I'm going to put this over here for a second. As long as I am in the human body, yes, the humanity of Jesus... Yes, there are going to be temptations. Satan's going to come after me, going to come after you. So that is true. I'm not saying there was some second work of grace or something where you can never be tempted. That, okay? That's Wesley and those guys, all right? But I also don't want to stand over here and debate with you because I want to come over here and I want to say, God tells me, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He tells me, you reckon yourself this way. He tells me, this is the way you see yourself, so I don't really care what everybody over here, that's trying to get me to see myself this way. No, thank you. I went to the operating table, brother, because I believe God's able to do what he says he can do. Amen? Amen. I'm going to continue to believe what God says. And sometimes, even in spite of my past behavior, I'm thankful for the renewing of the Holy Spirit, not preaching on that today, but this is who God says I am. I'm going back to this. I'm thankful that I can visit the graveyard in one sense. I don't want to forget my purification for my former sins. And I also want to remember this took place. The old guy died and a new person raised to walk in newness of life. This is how I want to live. It's who God made me to be. That new heart can't be tempted like the old one because that one's gone. It's been replaced. It's, it's been replaced with a new heart. And this new heart desires to please God. And so... Something I just, we're talking about authority of the scriptures today in adult Bible school class, really important. Because this is what you're going to come back to. And what I like to be able to come back to is God's always right. Always right. This is what he says takes place. He's right. I can believe that 100%. So it's really about remembering who I am in Christ. From that we have received a spiritual circumcision. Only surgeon that could ever do it, he's given that to us. He removed that body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. We've been buried. Leave the old guy dead. 
I would, and we're going to get to this in Colossians 3. I mean, it's amazing. The Holy Spirit is building something. But I got to, I won't say it. What was destroyed is not near as important as what's being built. God wants us to key in on what's being built. Okay? Been raised in immersion, raised to walk in newness of life. Who is that? Who are you? Remember that. Have faith in the working of God. So really a question. Do you believe? Do you believe that God has done what he's promised? Sometimes we've got to go back and rehash through this, don't we? I have to. God's right. This is who I am. This is who he made me to be. So if you believe what God's promised, then let's follow through. 2022. Let's walk as those new creatures, new heart. So, you know, circumcision, physical circumcision was a defining thing in the, the Jewish male. Spiritual circumcision is a defining thing in the realm of the spiritual. And, you know, Charlie was talking about if you're a person in prayer, you're really in touch with what's going on in the unseen realm. Brother, there are people out there who aren't people of prayer. But they're spiritually interested, and they couldn't tell you why. But there's a difference between people who have circumcised hearts and people who don't. And a lot of, for us to be able to accomplish the purpose of spreading the gospel and making disciples, we got to live, walk as people with circumcised hearts. Let's follow through in 2022.